there and welcome to Noclip Profiles, a new series where we visit the lives of the people who play and make games. Our first adventure sees me visit my own home country, Ireland, Erin, the land of saints and scholars, a country whose creative talents have poured outward into the rest of the world for generations. How peculiar then that I find myself returning home to talk to a foreigner, not just any, one of the most influential game designers of all time. John Romero, co-founder of id Software, is responsible for designing games like Wolfenstein, Doom, and Quake. Now he and his wife, famed developer and educator Brenda Romero, find themselves living in Galway, a picturesque city nestled into Ireland's craggy west coast. Trust me, it's more picturesque in the summer. So, what do you talk about when you have a couple of hours with John Romero, a man whose entire life has been catalogued in interviews, fan sites, and even de facto biographies? I mean, I want to ask him about Keen and Doom and Quake. I wanted to ask what was going on with his cancelled Kickstarter Black Room, but was told that conversation was currently off the table. I wanted to ask about Gunman Taco Truck, the food truck management sim come shooter designed by his son Donovan that they're currently wrapping up. I wanted to know how he feels about id Software's recent success. So many questions and so little time. But I guess a good as place as any to start is how exactly did he end up in Galway in the first place? Uh, well, we came here, Brenda and I, my wife Brenda Romero, um, she was on a Fulbright to Ireland uh, in 2014 and we came to Ireland to, to basically figure out what the game industry was like and what, what didn't need in the way of any kind of government help um, or anything to to succeed and do better. So we spent two and a half months driving everywhere in Ireland, from from Donegal, you know, Letterkenny, all the way down to Tralee, you know, and back and forth, uh, left and right as well. So um, we've been all over the island for two and a half months, and we eventually just went. You know, this is like the best place in the world. You know, it's it's beautiful. It's safe. The kids could walk around all day long we wouldn't have to worry about them because of just how uh, so people drive slow you know just, and everything um, about it was 10 miles you know better than than where we were in california in silicon valley so we decided to just pick it all up and move and we'd only been in galway for less than 24 hours when we decided that we wanted to be in galway um, and this is later, I mean, because we'd been everywhere. So the decision was, it's not just like, it was nice when we were there, but everything that we read about points that Galway is the friendliest city in the world. It is just the nicest, you know, nicest place. It's got an amazing culture here, you know, arts culture. There's festivals every day. It has tons of visitors here. Everybody wants a vacation in Galway that's in Ireland. And if Ireland's already a destination, this must be a really great place. Yeah. So far, it's excellent. It has not gone down at all. If, if not anything, it's gotten better. In the last place we moved at in California, after a year, we knew all the bad things about the place that we were in. <laughs> and it's like it's then it was just like can we how, how long can we deal with all the bad things here and but here in Galway there isn't anything like that my home country has always loved games when you live on a tiny island escapism is worth its weight in gold so it's no wonder Ireland had the second highest per capita of playstations in the world second only to Japan as such it shouldn't surprise you to know that Ireland is a massive hub for tech a mixture of an educated workforce low corporation tax and a general passion for creation has seen the games industry grow since the devastating economic crash almost 10 years ago wonderful games like Guild of Dungeoneering and the Little Acre have come out to critical applause, while organizations like Immert, which translates to play in English, have been formed by developers to encourage talent to stay in Ireland. So since Brenda and John initially came here to help support the fledgling industry, I asked John what he thinks of the state of games development in Ireland today. You know, it's pretty good. It's still, it's still very up and coming. But even in Galway, there's probably 10 game dev companies in Galway. And EA is also in Galway doing QA and customer support. Bethesda was here a little while ago. And there are other companies looking to relocate in Ireland. So there's a lot of activity. The IDA is really busy bringing people in. And we get to, we get to meet a lot of these companies that want to move here because we get to be like the people from the US saying, this is why we're here. We're like the canary in the coal mine. Exactly. And so, hopefully not a coal mine. It's not a coal mine. Yeah, it's like we're like, don't tell anybody. It's so great. We don't want to mess it up. You know, um, running the business is actually not that hard here. You know, it's pretty easy. It's really nice that the entire government is online, so taxes and stuff like that are paid online. You know how much 
money you've you've paid online if you need refunds you get them immediately I, we, we love things like how cheap the cell phones are here right. you know you don't need to plan it's like 20 euro a month with unlimited data like why wouldn't you want that we have a really nice office space it's, you know the rent rent here is like a fifth of california it's amazing and you're right downtown like you're and we're right downtown yeah right. city center you just walk outside the street and we're, we walk two streets over, we're right in the middle of everything. Like there's tourists all around us. Yeah, that's what's really great. When you have a game company, really any company, and people want to go eat, you don't want to be in some desolate area where everyone has to jump in a car and go drive to a jack-in-the-box, you know? It is kind of nice that um, here in Ireland, there's very, there are very few American corporations like McDonald's and Burger King and Subway. There's a McDonald's here and a Burger King and a Subway and there's a KFC a few miles away I haven't, I haven't even been to it but like that's pretty much it there's not it's not a commercial it's not a commercialized so you get to see the actual business owners everywhere here um, which is great we walk down the street and we want to buy fruit and there's Ernie and you know he's a super awesome guy and and Griffin's is right here it's an awesome bakery and uh, you know everything is just mom and pop owned in the entire city but uh, really it does not feel anything like the US where in the United States it's like why are you even moving you're gonna move somewhere else has all the same stuff around you why are you going anywhere <laughs> right so um, so that doesn't exist here. You can move into a little town and it's completely different than everybody else. There will be a Sentra or, or a Total or whatever for gas, you know, but other than that, everything is just brand new. Do you like a pack of Tato? I'm not a big Tato fan. I actually, uh, mostly what we've eaten here are, um, are Pringles. Oh, right. That's it's kind of funny. In Europe, Pringles are all over and the amount of flavors are insane. In the U.S., it was like original. Yeah. You know, and over here, there's just like 20 flavors. It's pretty great. Gotta have them all. Yeah. <laughs> In the U.S., to eat um, turkey or ham and gravy with potatoes and stuffing, like that's Thanksgiving and that's Christmas. And over here, that's every single day. And you can have as much gravy as you want. And you can go every day and have, and, and when you order turkey, you always get ham. You don't have to go turkey or ham. You just get turkey and ham on stuffing. It's insane. It's like every single day. So we OD'd on that when we first got here. It was probably like two or three weeks of every day we went and had insane gravy. And, uh, and then we chilled out and got to eat other things like pizza. <laughs> Before today, I'd never met John Romero, so I was curious as to what type of person he is. Whenever we come across his name, it tends to be in retrospective articles about his past work. Games like Doom, Quake, Daikatana. It can leave the impression of a person living in the past, holding on to past glories. Or was it something else? Was it simply that that's all anyone ever asks him about? It's amazing to be here and like see all of the, the, the relics of, of days past. Do you ever get sick of people asking you about it, though? No, no, because I mean, you know, when I think about it, um, I watch interviews with, with like metal guitarists and stuff because I love heavy metal and I really love guitar. And so I'll look at interviews with Reb Beach and he's being interviewed. And these people want to talk about the classic stuff that he did. And that's what I would want to talk to him about as well. So, you know, he's, he's very nice giving interviews. 1,000 times about the same stuff and you know that he has said this so many times but not to that person from South America, right? <laughs> and so... <laughs> and do you like jogging your memory? Do you, do you I do it, yeah. I, I do it all the time, yeah. I, I, I have a really great memory and and lately I've been revising my uh, ROME.RO website. So since 97 I, I've had all my Apple II games ready to to do something with it. And so now with all the great editing tools and Vimeo and YouTube and everything, um, now I basically am making videos of my Apple II games running, um, but it's great that I can record those and now I'm doing voiceovers, I'm talking about the games as it is, I'm playing them and kind of letting people kind of see, this is what I made in 1982 and this is what I was thinking about and that kind of stuff and putting up web pages and just, if I can just get that stuff out on a website page, then I can get rid of all that <laughs> old pattern. Yeah, I don't have to worry about it because it's all, everything I could remember is right there. 
But it seems like from talking to you and Brenda and, and seeing some of the stuff that you've preserved over the years, it seems like just in general, you're a fan of games history preservation. Oh, yeah. It just so happens that you were actually part of it as well. Right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have, um, in fact, we were talking earlier about Nasser Jabeli mm -hmm. and how he's this, you know, very rare bird that people, you know, don't really get to meet. And in 1998, when I had an Apple II reunion, I hired um, a guy to do video and record everything that was happening. And so we all kind of swapped out interviewing Steve Wozniak and Nasser Jabeli and all these people. And so I was interviewing Nasser. It's like a 20 minute interview I did with him. It's the only one that has ever been done and <laughs> ever will be done. Like no one will ever get to interview Nasser again. He's done, I guess, interviewing. Do we do a bad job of trying to retain that stuff? Uh, I've seen more of it now than I ever did in the past because people are, yeah, everybody's trying to keep this stuff alive now. It's not just a couple places, a lot of places are doing it. And some places are just businesses doing it, you know, museums. I was listening to an interview that Richard Garriott did um, not too long ago, and he was talking about how he got started on uh, the University Computers in Texas, in Austin. That's kind of how I got started in California, was on a university computer in Sierra, at Sierra, and he did the same thing probably about three years earlier than I did. But we both started at the very beginning of the industry, where the, the computer game industry really started in 1976. That was really the day, the year that games were beginning to be written, like on the actual first wave of the, the first three computers that, that hit everything, the Radio Shack, you know, TRS-80 TRS Model 1, Commodore Pet, and the Apple II. So from that, that year going forward, that's really the computer industry, and, and I have a lot of stuff from that very beginning time period of it, which is the hardest part to preserve. Everybody's kept cartridges and all that kind of stuff, lots of that exists, but it's the earliest Ziploc baggy stuff that is the hardest to find and track down. It was such a small industry back then. Like Brenda, when she was when she had started in 1981, she was one of five women in the industry. That's about it. Like there's hardly anyone there, um, and everybody knew each other. And from the West Coast Computer Fair, that was the beginning of the the industry. Is where that's kind of started. Was at the West Coast Computer Fair. Before then, it was it was even less than that. Really, the, the industry started with indies. So publishers were just a few people and all their games came from indies writing games in, at home, sending them in and they would get them into stores. Like that's what, that's what a publisher's job was back then was advertise magazines and go on foot or on phone and get your stuff into stores and that was what a publisher did. They didn't have teams in, in publishers back then. So all the, the whole game industry was started by indie developers. John's passion for games preservation comes from his adoration of the creators who came before him. Before ever making it big himself, John had practiced creating games for almost a decade. But as hard as he tried, he struggled to find that winning combination to make a name for himself. You know, getting to Origin was was the result of eight years of programming and learning and publishing and getting my stuff out there. And, um, and this is all during high school, you know? <laughs> so I'm doing as much as I can, as fast as I can, and, and I was going as fast as possible because I wanted to, to make one of the best games that anyone could have played on an Apple II. And I'm looking at Origin, yeah, I'm looking at the Ultima series, and I'm looking at serious software stuff that NASA wrote, and I'm looking at the best games, and, and I'm mentally, I'm competing with Jordan Mechner and, and Doug Smith and everybody, Dan, Dan Gorlin. I'm, I'm competing with these guys. And, you know, they got to code all day long. I had to go to high school. And I coded as much in high school as I could. <laughs> Like I'm writing code in class and going home and typing it in and I mean I did that for years trying to become the best and uh, by the time the, at the when it hit when 1989 uh, hit the industry like died and it was the 8-bit industry not PC PC was the next thing so um, I knew I had to get out of 8-bit and that and with that I knew I was done with everything that I had learned which is. 10 years of knowing everything about a computer's internal hardware, which back then it wasn't knowing languages, it was knowing computers, it was knowing every byte in a computer's memory and what they did because you needed to know all of that. You needed to know the hardware, you had to know everything. So that investment, um, because of that mental investment, a lot of programmers never made the jump from 8-bit out because that was like their life was wrapped up in this language and this 
system. And he kind of had to move beyond that to kind of get it to, to keep going. And so for me, I was like, well, obviously I got to get off this computer and I have to move on to the computer that I hate, which was the PC. <laughs> and, and I had to do it. I had a wife and I had two kids and it was time to go. So, um, so I did it because of that. And it was a lot of new stuff to learn. It took about a year, almost a year and a half before meeting John Carmack and hiring him for this new game disc that I was making, before he made the, um, the Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement demo. And until that point, like I tried for so long and I didn't make it, I tried as hard as I could to make so many games back then, dozens and dozens of games, and they didn't hit big. Um, people knew my name and stuff, but it wasn't like I had written a load runner, you know. Right. Only within two years after that were, was BAM at the very top again. Mm -hmm. And that was mainly because of working with the team instead of just doing it all by myself like I had been for years. And John Carmack being an incredible programmer and Tom Hall being an unbelievable creative uh, creative talent and, uh, and Adrian being an unbelievable artist, you know, that was those were the first computer dots he'd ever put on the computer screen in his life, you know. John speaks of the days of id Software with fondness. Paired with the creative talents of the Carmacks and Tom Hall, his imagination was given new wings on which to fly. From that moment on, him and the team at id Software created a murderer's row of classics. They evolved John's Mario clone into Commander Keen, a shareware distributed platformer for home computers. But it wasn't until they turned their attention on beating up Nazis that id Software became one of the biggest names in games. Wolfenstein was our third shooter. Um, we'd already made Hover Tank 1 and then we made Catacomb 3D and, uh, and each one was, you know, you know, Hover Tank 1 was the first solid fill polygon game and then Catacombs, which is funny, it doesn't get enough recognition, it was the first texture mapped 3D game, right? Not, not the very first in the world, but the first action, like fast action one. Um, in 1985, a game called uh, Alternate Reality of the City was actually the first game on a Commodore 64 to have texture mapping, even though it was really primitive. But, uh, but when we did that, you know, November of 1991, that was really new, and it was an EGA, which is insanely hard to program that. E VGA was so much easier to do. EGA was a nightmare. But then when we did Wolfenstein, we finally had digital audio, which totally changed the feeling of the game. And John was better at, at getting the speed up and VGA was so much easier to deal with and be super fast. It was a 70 frames per second game and because VGA monitors were at 70 where today monitors are at 60 or multiples of 60. So uh, it went super fast, it sounded incredible, like the chain gun was the best thing in the world. And we were remaking Wolfenstein, which already had a great story behind it, it had a great premise. It was the third one, because there was Castle Wolfenstein beyond Castle Wolfenstein, and we were making Wolfenstein 3, and so that's why we called it 3D. From starting it to getting the show episode finished was four months, and it was four of us to, to do that. And then Kevin Cloud and Jay Wilbur joined as a CEO, and, uh, and Kevin was an artist and was doing some product stuff, so he was creating brochures and stuff for us to get ready to start self-publishing. He helped do all the layout for the um, for the hint book that we were coming up with, Wolfenstein's hint book. So we knew it was going to be huge. And the first the first month, Wolfenstein sold 4,000 units without advertising or anything. It was giant, and it just went like crazy. It blew away all the Commander Keen stuff that, that we had made. And the, and the funny thing is Commander Keen actually made really good money. Ken Williams at Sierra was offering to buy the company at, at, in early 92 for two and a half million bucks. And he couldn't believe how much money we were making on Commander Keen. He's like, shareware? Nah. And uh, anyway, Wolfenstein just like blew that down, down the street. But the cool thing is stacking income. We had Keen and Wolfenstein, and then we made Spirit of Destiny, and then we made Doom, and it's like you just keep on making all these games. And the turnover on them is incredibly fast, like. Well, because we worked our asses off, right. and you know we had a lot of fun making Wolfenstein. Actually, it was probably the most, one, the first time we had a lot of fun making a game because it was in Dallas. It was hot. We had a swimming pool <laughs> right behind us. We could go out and swim anytime we want to. Um, when we were in Shreveport, we were on the lake and we could, would go out kneeboarding, but only when it was like weekends and Jay's there because it was his boat. As it was becoming more successful, they could finally afford a dedicated office space. The team moved out of the lake house and set up shop in a one bedroom loft at La Prada Club Apartments in Mesquite, Texas. It was here that each team member rented their own apartment place to live in, taking a short amble to work every morning. And uh, we would go in and, and just 
basically make games all day and play Fatal Fury and Street Fighter and stuff while we're getting mentally drained from making the most boring levels in the world, which is Wolfenstein. It was hard to make those levels. Keen's levels were much more fun, but Wolfenstein's were just brain dead. Um, I mean, I, it, it was more fun writing the hint book than it was making the levels. Because in the hint book, you had to explain killing somebody in every different possible way that you could explain killing. Because you don't want to just say, kill the guard and get the key. Kill this guard, kill that guard, you know. Then it was like, lay down the uniforms and, you know, like, we come up with all kinds of funny stuff. Yeah, but then we pumped out, uh, we got, we spent an extra two months getting the last uh, five episodes of Wolfenstein right. finished. So the whole thing was, was done, and then we spent two months making Spear of Destiny and getting that out the door. With Wolfenstein, the first person shooter as we know it today was born, but there's another game that defined the genre for decades to come. Its influence can be felt still today, especially here at the Romero Games office, where artifacts and shrines can be spotted every time you turn your head. So I asked John, is Doom his proudest development achievement? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to say so, because <clears throat> we did a lot of things at once in that game, like modding, like like LAN deathmatch, like for the first time, no one had ever played a game like that before, especially at that speed. And it was the beginning of a new culture of playing deathmatch games, LAN gaming, and then esports right after that. And so that was the beginning game that was like that. No one ever had um, like the attitude that that didn't exist before Doom. Um, when you're playing deathmatch like that, no game was that intense ever before Doom. And so playing Doom, if you play for hours and hours on a LAN, like you move so fast and you can get so brutal in that game. And then it's the psychology of playing those levels over and over again. And if you're playing with someone who's really, really good, it gets so fun because it's all psychology. You know, everybody's already skillful at everything. Uh, that kind of feel in a game had never existed before. And I remember while, before John had actually put in the multiplayer stuff, um, I was visualizing, I was making E1M7 at the time, and I was visualizing uh, being in part of that level, looking out and seeing two people rocketing each other, and I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be insane. There's nothing like this. So when I, when I visualized that, I was like, this is going to be the craziest game planet Earth's ever seen. And then it's got to get even crazier because you also invented modding, basically. Then. Uh, yeah, and then modding and letting everybody else do it. It was like building a platform for everyone to be creative on top of, where Minecraft has a platform that you're creative inside of, right. you know, and you can add to it as well. You get to do both things. Um, but with Doom being the first one, it was opening it up for everybody, giving all the specs out so people can make editors, because we couldn't actually put a give our editor out because of our next step. It wasn't even on DOS. <laughs> so it was a totally different or, uh, OS that no one had. So we had to just give all the, all the data away so people could make levels based off that, the level editors based off that data. And then um, just the thousands of levels that started pouring out of people immediately, and people were getting good at making levels with the examples that we basically gave them. Here's abstract level design style. Presumably you had more fun designing those levels than you did with Wolf 3D. Oh yeah, way more. It was actually more fun making those levels than any levels, obviously, before then. And I'd been making levels since the 80s, you know, I mean, we're using random number generators or doing it manually with editors I've written um, or using text as data, you know, all kinds of different ways. But with Doom, you know, they, they looked better than any game I'd ever seen and they could be as crazy as I could think of them to be crazy. Within reason, obviously, it's not full 3D. It was really fun, like, uh, coming up with the rules, new rules for how to make levels. And so one of the important rules that, that had to happen pretty early during Doom's development was this level could never exist in Wolfenstein, otherwise you failed, <laughs> right? If a room looks like it could have been in Wolfenstein, you have not tried hard enough. So add a shitload of detail to it, you know, make some lighting changes, put a lava path through it, you know, do something. Stairs. Yeah, and then with, with Quake it was the same thing. If this could have been made in Doom, right. then you failed. You know, look up, what's the ceiling look like? <laughs> you know, can I go under stuff? And so it was like, you know, making these rules and it's like landmarks and revisiting locations to burn in like what this level's, you know, uh, lo locality is like. Seeing stuff, aspirational views into areas, um, you know, secrets all over the place, a la Mario. All of these things that we kind of dragged with us from Commander Keen through Wolfenstein into Doom, uh, he represented in different ways. 
and then adding more to it. You know, it's like we're building a lexicon of, of terms for this 3D level design thing that didn't really exist. Like Keen, it would follow up Doom with mission packs and sequels. It wasn't until three years later in 1996 that its latest IP would take the world by storm. But the story of the development of Quake has its fair share of casualties. After years of working themselves to the bone, the team at it was starting to crack. There were 13 people, and I mean, I'm counting the uh, secretary. Miss Donna? Uh, yeah, Donna. <laughs> Donna and Jay and Mike, you know, like, and, and Sean and American. Like, these, yeah. you know, American finally moved on to dev, but, um, like, there's four extra people. Quake took nine people, and then there were four other people, and that was 13 was the size of the company, you know, by the time Quake had come out. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it had stayed small, and, uh, you know, I had wanted it to get a little bit bigger during that time because I had wanted us to start doing our own distribution publishing earlier. We did it finally with Doom, but I wanted to do it with Wolfenstein. Um, even while we we're making the second set of Keens, I was bugging Carmack about doing that. And it's like, we gotta hire somebody, we gotta do this. Like, we can't let him be in charge of our money. Because right. if he doesn't wanna pay us, we're screwed. And it's just because of this one thing. We need multiple sources of revenue coming in. And, you know, why aren't we making pillows and all that kind of stuff? We need more people to do that. And, you know, John was against growing the company. Um, but I wanted to merchandise and, and do all kinds of other stuff. Why was he against growing it? Uh, because it would take the focus away from the game, and that focus on the game was the reason why the game was great. Um, but the thing is, um, as the technology started to get more complex, it started to take longer to create, and you can't keep a, a, a development team in a holding pattern for too long before people just can't handle it anymore. And that was the mistake that we made with Quake, was that we didn't split the company into an engine dev and a game dev where we're using whatever the latest tech is that we had made already and making newer games with that, that older tech while uh, John creates the next wave of technology. And when that's ready, then we jump on it after we're finished with this thing. We should have done that with Quake, but we were too naive in, in running companies to know like that it was gonna even take a year to get an engine that we could use, you know? That was how long it took to make the whole Doom and ship it, you know? So um, we had no idea that it was going to be that big of a task and, and um, that people would get burned out because they thought they were making a game, but they really weren't and throwing data away and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so it, was a, it was a very hard game to make and I think that we would have survived together longer if we would have split up into game dev and, and engine dev. We didn't, with Quake, there was mostly a technology mandate. It was like, we're going to do true 3D in this game. The identity of the game needs to kind of come from a certain certain place. And so um, I thought, you know, why don't we keep on experimenting with different ways of playing a game that's in first person? Can you be up on top of a mountain and get hit in the back of the head and tumble forward using visual triggers to make things happen instead of me having to walk through a volumetric cube or a line segment to make something happen? Why can't it happen if I just look at it? So the idea was, you know, we're going to make it different. Um, let's make this Lovecraftian feeling and let's make it be violently unsettling. The idea of nothing standing still was also at that time 320 by 200 was a standard resolution of games. And when you look at a screen full of 320 by 200 pixels, you know, they're kind of big and, and uh, when you're not moving, you don't have a very good representation of what things are in the distance until you move then you see them better because of the artifacting. So I thought, you know, what better way to make the game feel violently unsettling than to have your view never stop moving even when you stop. Not to make you breathe, but to make the screen just slightly move as if you're moving in the wind, right? Just a little bit. So John coded a sinusoidal function that worked off of a multiplier value. Set the value to something, not, not very big, but it kind of moved a little bit too much. And we were at a point, when that came in the end of the engine, we were at a point where like any disagreement would like immediately just get shot down. Whatever you thought you were doing, don't do that because we don't want to disagree, otherwise we won't even finish this game. Right. We'll all blow up and this company will be done and we won't even finish the game. So let's just shut up and not add things that make people mad. And so when um, they got that in there, John got that in there, and I showed Adrian, and uh, and I said it wouldn't be as, as crazy as this, it would be a lot less, and he's just like, that makes me sick. I'm like, 
okay, we'll just make it zero. Oh. But I should have made a point zero zero one because because uh, it's pretty cool to see the screen just slightly shifting. Yeah. Very, you can it's barely perceptible, but you feel like the screen never it's never static. It's still in there. So that that function is in there. And if you I use it for the intermission cameras. When you finish a level and you're looking from any of the four random cameras that I place in level, then you you see it moving yeah. like that. Now that's that's actually a, a bigger version of that number. It's the same function running with that same value. It's just that during the intermission, the value gets changed from zero and then back to zero. So anyway, it was the game had to have that that palette. Uh, one of the reasons like people were complaining about the palette being all browns and grays and stuff is because um, because we were using light maps and we were trying to have 16 gradients per color. That chops down the amount of colors you can have in a game. When you have 16 values going from black to the color, that limits everything that you can do. Um, so we, you know, and, or maybe it was 32. I think it was 32 because I think Doom had 16. Because you went from zero to 255 in Doom, and it was 16 steps. So we had 32. So we only had eight colors or something, right? Because we had a palette of 256. So to do really nice light maps, I think we might have even been in between 24s or something like that. But we needed to have better gradients and stuff to show all the cool light light mapping and everything. Um, and, uh, and so it chewed up our colors. So we had hardly any colors. That is like the most tuned palette ever. And nobody appreciates how hard it was to do that in software. When, as soon as the video cards came out in 97, it's like, who cares, man? Just let, throw a light in there. Like several other team members, Quake would be the last game John worked at, at the very company he founded. I asked him to take me back 20 years and explain what it was like creating such an influential game and why he ultimately decided to walk away. No November of 95 is when I decided I was leaving it. We had had um, a big meeting and we were deciding where Quake was gonna go because now the engine's ready to get to actually be used on the game. You know, half the team was just destroyed mentally from trying to make a game and throwing away 50 levels and throwing away tons of code and everything because the engine gets better. That level's garbage now. You gotta make a whole new level, you know, it's like, why do I keep on doing this? It's like, well, the engine's not ready, so don't really make a game, you know? By then, we had a big, fateful company meeting where we decided how are we gonna finish the game, and, and John was on the fence, and the, the, the people who had been in the company, never from the beginning of a game, this is the first time they'd been from the beginning of a game, were the ones who were completely burnt out and couldn't even see experimenting with world-first game design. And I was for that, I was like, okay, now we can actually spend our time doing a really amazing game design, and half the people are like, throw a gun in the middle and call it Doom 5 or whatever and get it done. So anyway, uh, when I saw that, that just us owners should be the ones really making that that decision and that there wasn't una uh, it wasn't unanimous between us, I was just like, it's not the same anymore. And so um, so that's what happened. I finished the game and then I left and then John or Tom quit uh, 3D Realms and we started Iron Storm. By six months after I left, half of it was gone. So half the people had left, Jay had left, Sandy was leaving, Sean left, Mike left. And so they had to hire in new people like Paul Steed and, and Jake Ways and kind of rebuild and try and figure out who can be the creative chief, which is, you know, a hard one. Yeah, big time. Seems like they've only maybe just figured it out. Now, <laughs> yeah. Um, what's it like looking at a company then which you basically like founded? I, I'm, I'm amazed that they survived Doom 4. Right. I'm amazed because that game was hard to get out. Um, but having uh, selling the company was the best thing they ever did. The fact that the game, you know, they stuck with it to get that game great, and that game came out and did so well, um, showed they can build it there and they can take direction and they should have a future, right? And so I'm like, they're gonna make 30 years, yes. <laughs> so that's awesome, you know? There's, you know, out of the company, nine different companies I've founded, only three are still around. Uh, have you played the, the 2016 version of Doom? I haven't played it. Well, first of all, I don't play shooters on console. Right. And I just recently got a uh, Windows computer, so. Yeah, because you're a Mac head. Yeah, still. total Mac, yeah. <laughs> So I'll get it on there and then I'll actually play it. Yeah, and I heard it's amazing, you know, the campaign mode is. I played the sing the multiplayer and, and wasn't happy with loadouts and Halo, basically. <laughs> so um, so that wasn't something that I'll get into, but definitely the single player. 
John hasn't gotten the rounds of playing last year's Doom campaign quite yet, but I wanted to ask him about the games he had been enjoying recently. We had had lunch together earlier, where he'd waxed lyrical about how much he'd been enjoying a certain assassination game. I think everybody is so happy that IO Interactive has turned it around and has kicked ass with the new Hitman game. The first Hitman that I played was Silent Assassin, you know, Hitman 2, and that was incredible. Love the series, but um, it, was, it wasn't until this newest one that it really just like went to the top again, top of the heap. Dropping a boat on somebody was pretty cool on the, in the boat scene. It was just an amazingly well done game. The fact that they decided to go deep and they could go deep on those levels just shows they're just a great set of designers there. You're a big Helmet Kruger fan? Yeah, so funny. <laughs> and it's funny because I was getting through the game without even doing that. And I was like, that's a, that's a challenge right there. You know, there's a challenge up there. I gotta do it. I can, and I'm like, I can't believe I would be walking down that catwalk, you know? And then just like, I'm in line behind everyone else, and now it's my turn. And it's like, holy crap, I'm actually in front of everybody. No one knows it's me. You know, and I walk out the front after assassinating everybody, and just like, nobody knows. Yeah, and everyone thinks I'm awesome, and it's so funny. You smell good, Mr. Kruger. Well, Uncharted 4, amazing game. Um, beautiful, beautiful game. It's super fun, it looks great, it makes sense, it's well designed. I like secret stuff all over the place, you're finding idols and things. Um, and then inside is incredible <laughs> ideas in that game, you know, love it. Limbo was already awesome, and this is just a much more refined Limbo, but with an even better story. So, uh, it's, you know, it's a social media allegory, kind of. Right. And, um, and, it's, uh, and it's just perfectly done. Those guys can't do anything wrong. You know, Beginner's Guide was a huge, huge thing playing that. I haven't touched Firewatch yet, but I can't wait to, to, to get into Firewatch. Legion, playing the hell out of Legion, yeah. You're back in? Yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. Played WoW for so many years, you know. I have all 10, 10 character slots and everything, you know, and they just have done such a great job making it still feel good. A really good rotation. And PvP is easier to deal with now. You don't have to go and grind gear and stuff. So it's just, you know, great stories as usual. Great characters, great cinematic stuff. Lots more ability in the engine to do things. Yeah, so it's, I just love it. I'd w ask what's next for Romero Games, but I can see Donovan's game getting finished inside. Yeah, we're finishing Gunman Taco Truck and it's shipping this this month, just in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, and then hopefully we'll be starting on our next big game. And uh, can't make any announcements about it, but uh, th it'll be announced at some point. You know, probably from the publisher, not from us. And uh, we'll be making it here in Galway, which is a really great thing for the city and um, and uh, game development here in general. We're here to, to do as much as we can and, uh, and to, the whole the whole island is waiting for a cool game to come out. Like, you know, when, when is Minecraft gonna happen out of Ireland? And Guild of Dungeoneering, I think, so far is like that cool game. Um, and uh, and so we're, we're, everyone's trying to, to one up. You know, everyone's trying to one up everything. Do you and Brenda feel like you're part of that big Irish gaming community now that you're sort of all together trying to, to get our little Yep, on. yeah, we totally feel like it. You know, we are at as many events as we can make. We speak all over the place in Ireland. Um, we uh, participate in the game jams. You know, we're at all the expos and we show off Gunman. And yeah, I mean, we're as, as involved as we can get. Uh, and, uh, and so everybody knows us here too. So it's, it's pretty cool. We can kind of get to see people finish their games and ship them and move on to new things and all that. And, um, and uh, people just keep doing it. They're still going, and there's lots of there's lots of people helping other people. The Start Lab hosts two game companies. The Porter Shed is hosting a few more, you know. Um, and uh, and so it's just like everybody is everyone's helping everyone to try and become successful here, which is really great. It feels like the beginning of the industry. Sitting down to talk to John today is as close to chatting to a video games oracle as I've ever gotten. He's a person who lives both in the past and the future. A creative soul with a deep passion for games that can be seen in the way he lives his life. He holds both a respect for those who have gone before him and a passion to pave the way for those who are coming up next. More than anything, he's somebody who loves making games. His Moby Games profile registers credits for over 130 titles. Classics like Doom, Quake and Wolfenstein. Failures you may have heard of like Dyke 
Katana, and successes you may not have, like Ravenwood Fair. But more than anything, it's clear from talking to John that he's an indie developer at heart. His favorite days at id was when the studio was small and scrappy. So it's no surprise, really, that they've decided to set up Romero Games in Galway, a town full of family businesses, a support network, much like those old Apple II days. Himself, Brenda, and their family have found a new life in Ireland among the Indies. But before I said goodbye, I wanted to give John one final test. After 18 months living in the country I like to call home, I wanted to know how he was faring with our native tongue, Gaelic, or as most of us natives call it, Irish. A uh, bunch of little bitty words, you know, lots of little um, schlan, you know, uh, schlanawalia and in, in falcha and. You know, we can read, you know, oh, on mock, that's the exit. You know, like, so I can actually look at an Irish word and know exactly how to say it. Basically throw away the second vowel. Just right. throw it in the trash. <laughs> Doesn't exist. In that case, Gravita Mahagas, John Sean, August Slano on it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.